point, please uh, shout them out or type them out, but preferably shouting. It's good to actually hear you. And not literally shout. You don't have to go, what's a solvent? But, you know, um, if you do have any questions, please um, chime in, okay? So the name of the game today, Concentration Solutions and Dilution. So we're gonna start off, spend the first 10 or 15 minutes talking about the idea of concentration and a few different ways it can be measured. So first of all, what is concentration? Uh, concentration is a measurement of the relative amount of a solute dissolved into a solvent. So it gives us an idea of um, how much stuff you've dissolved in the other stuff. I'm using very, very scientific and precise terms here. Um, we'll delve into many different examples of this in a hot second. So a concentrated solution has a relatively large amount of the solute. So let's take, for example, um, actually first let's define dilute. A dilute solution has a relatively low solute dissolved into it. So an example of a dilute solution versus a concentrated solution would be if you had a pot of water and you put a crack of salt into it. You'd have a little bit of salt dissolved into it, but overall it would be a pretty dilute salt water solution. Now, if you went over to the ocean and you took a scoop of water out of it for some reason, that would be an example of a concentrated salt solution. There is a lot of salt of brine dissolved into the ocean. Okay, and if at any point you want me to um, slow down, change the pace, etc., cetera, um, please just let me know. Also, I'll be posting this video as soon as it processes, processes from Zoom, so I'll be able to rewatch it for any calculations and things like that. Okay, any questions so far? Uh, yeah, this is kind of a kind of a side thing. So, when dissolving salt in water, you there is there comes a point where the water is completely uh, saturated with salt and literally Correct. salt will just sit in the bottom, right? You're actually looking ahead to the, uh, the last slide of today. Um, <laughs> so we, we will we'll talk about that. Okay. Um, everything does have a limit as the amount of stuff you can dissolve into it. Um, and so we will address that. But yes, there becomes a tipping point for um, salt water. If um, We'll get to that. Um, and there's a, uh, I've got a, dumb anecdote regarding that as well. So yes, hold on to that question. So we're gonna look at four different ways of reporting concentration. The first is mass percentage. Mass percentage is useful when you're dissolving a solid into a liquid. So if you know how much liquid you have and you're dumping in you know, however much solid, it's an easier way than measuring say, the volume because solids you know, can be kind of packed into different volumes. Anyway, an example. Well, first, how do we calculate it? Mass percentage is equal to the mass of the solute that you're dissolving divided by the total mass of the solution, then times 100 because it's a percentage. Okay. So it's literally, if you have um, say 100 grams of stuff, it tells us how many grams are a given substance. So if you have a mixture that consists of sugar, salt, water, carbon dioxide, um, some sort of salty soda pop, I guess in this case, um, it tells you the actual mass breakdown, how many grams for every 100 grams are sugar, salt, etc. So for example, let's say you have 20 grams of sugar and you're dissolving it into 100 grams of water. Well, the way that we would do this calculation is the mass percentage is equal to, in this case, our solute is the sugar. So we're pouring sugar into water. Maybe it's tea, maybe it's coffee. I don't know, maybe it's just a glass of water that we're making sugary. So 20 grams of sugar, that's our solute, divided by, and then in order to get the mass of the solution, we need to take into account the fact that well, both the sugar and the water are contributing. So it's 120 total grams times 100. And again, the way that we got that number is 20 grams of sugar plus 100 grams of water 
gives us our 120 total grams. And this ends up being 16.7% sugar by mass. So the next time you have, say, 100 grams of tea, if you pour in 20 grams of sugar, which is probably excessive into it, you can say, hey, my tea is 16.7% sugar by mass. This isn't tea, it's coffee, and I prefer not putting sugar in. Well, this is kind of fun, we'll have a prop of the day. This is my chemistry mug. They're, uh, one of them's overreacting, kitschy, anyway. Way of reporting concentration number two, molarity. This way is near and dear to chemists, probably the most useful one in chemistry because moles are the universal currency of chemistry. So molarity gives us a way of actually seeing, um, if you're performing a reaction, grams are, um, grams don't necessarily tell you how much stuff there is. So like a gram of hydrogen is a lot different in terms of the amount of hydrogen than a gram of uranium, which is much heavier. So grams, volume, et cetera, are all relative to the substance that you're using. But moles, those are universally transferent. Those are the universal currency of chemistry. So molarity, its definition is, it's the moles of a solute divided by the total liters of solution. So molarity, we sometimes say moles per liter. We sometimes say molar. The way that we represent it is just by using a capital M. So capital M means the moles per liter of something. Take for example, let's say you dissolve six moles of hydrochloric acid into two liters total of solution. The way that we would calculate this is the molarity is equal to, we have six moles of HCl that we're dissolving, divided by the two liters of solution. And just so that we don't have to keep writing out S, you know, writing out the whole word solution. Well, solen is a uh, common abbreviation for it. Equals three molar HCl. So oftentimes molarity is used when talking about acids, bases, and really any chemical reagent that is dissolved in a liquid. So whenever you have an aqueous solution that you're trying to react with something else, molarity is sort of the creme de la creme of units. And we can say three capital M HCl, that means three molar. We could also just say a three molar solution of HCl or we could just say there's three moles per liter. All of these mean the same thing, okay? And in terms of um, acids, for HCl, they can get up to 18 molar. Um, same thing with acetic acid. So um, in general, a molar is a, a fairly concentrated, if something is one molar or greater, it's usually pretty concentrated. You can technically calculate the concentration of water. In case you're wondering, water is 56.6 molar. So for every liter of water, there are 56.6 moles of water. Arbitrary fact of the day. Volume percentage. Volume percentage is a pretty common thing that we find on um, liquid products. So what they, this is useful if you're mixing together two different liquids into each other. Because um, liquids you can measure if you have some sort of like volumetric flask, for example, or if you have um, a beaker or an Erlum. Oh, I should have brought in some props. Hmm. I'll grab a prop in a second. Volume percentage is equal to the volume of the solute divided by the total volume of the solution times 100 by virtue of being a percentage. So a common example right now is the CDC recommends that um, hand sanitizers and alcohol-based disinfectants should be 60% alcohol by volume. 
So let's say you're making some sort of sanitizing spray. You pour in 30 milliliters of ethanol and 20 milliliters of water. The volume percentage is equal to 30 milliliters of ethanol divided by the total volume, which is 50 total milliliters, which would give us 60% ethanol by volume, which again is what the CDC recommends in terms of um, concentration for hand sanitizers. Let me grab a prop. Be right back. Prop time. Props. Um, here I have a beaker drinking mug um, because I'm a tool and I have this sort of stuff at home. So this would be useful for making a volume percentage. You can fill up to a certain line, pour in and enjoy. For some reason, I also have an Erlenmeyer flask. Um, just casual things. Everybody's got an Erlenmeyer flask lying around, right? Anyway, so these have a certain amount. They have the volumes that you can add up to on the side. So if I'm mixing together two liquids, I can just read how much I'm pouring in to my solution. So it's a useful, viable way of reporting these things. There's a question in the chat. Right? Yeah. I mean, I went to a wedding once where, um, so there were two people who met at the chemistry department and the uh, centerpieces, the bouquets were actually held in Erlenmeyer flasks and they ordered uh, an excessive number. So they actually, as long as they haven't been used for chemicals, they're kind of fun to use for like, you know, having a glass of water or something. So anyway, chemistry glassware, good times. Way of reporting concentration number four, mole fraction and parts per million. This is gonna be more useful in looking at say atmospheric science. So mole fraction is useful when you're looking at um, a mixture that has lots of different things in it. For example, the air that we breathe in. It's got nitrogen, it's got oxygen, it's got carbon dioxide, it's got methane, it's got um, xenon, it's got argon, it's got helium in varying concentrations. We'll look at that in a moment. And the way that we define mole fraction is it's literally, if you have um, a sample of, it tells you how many moles of a substance you have for um, every um, given amount of a sample. So we define it as X sub A, and we have N sub A divided by N tote. N sub A is the moles of whatever substance you're looking at. And N tote is the total moles in the sample. And in about a minute, we'll look at the specific example, the breakdown of our atmosphere, to kind of make this a little bit more tangible. But basically mole fraction tells us for every, you know, one mole of sample, what fraction of that is a given substance, like nitrogen or oxygen, et cetera. Okay. By definition, mole fraction must add up to one. So if you're looking at a collection of things, and you're adding together all the mole fractions, if you're taking into account all the different things present in this mixture and you add up their mole fractions, they have to equal one. So like if you're looking at the atmosphere and you add up the mole fractions of all the gases, they have to equal one because you're taking into account 100% of the atmosphere. So N sub A plus N sub B plus et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, however many things you have, they all have to equal one. So this can be useful if you know that you have say 20% one gas, 30% another gas, and then some mystery gas. The mystery gas would be 50% of 
um, the remaining 50% of the sample. Which brings us to parts per million. Parts per million is useful if you have something that's very dilute. So parts per million is oftentimes used for say, um, metabolic byproducts in the body. If they're not very concentrated, saying parts per million is more useful than saying, say, 0 0.000003 molar. Parts per million just gives us a, a more workable number. Another common example for this is when looking at things that are dilute in our atmosphere. Like for example, um, argon or helium or carbon dioxide. Again, more on that in one moment. And so parts per million is literally, for every one million molecules you have in a sample, how many of them are a specific substance? And mathematically, we can define it as the mole fraction times a million. So that's a quick way that we can go about finding parts per million if we have mole fraction. This again becomes easier if we have a concrete example. So let's take a look at a concrete example. Here we have the breakdown of gases in our atmosphere. So most of our atmosphere is made of nitrogen, N2. Um, N2 is an inert gas. It's got a triple bond. It's really strong. It's hard to break. It doesn't react with much. So as a result, um, it's OK that we're breathing in a lot of it. About 78% of the air we breathe in is nitrogen. It goes in. It does a lot of nothing. We breathe it out. It's cool. Oxygen is about 21% of the air that we breathe in. Um, obviously, oxygen does do something. It's kind of important. Um, and then we also have argon, CO2, neon. This is an abridged list. Um, there's also a bunch of other noble gases that are present, methane, other various things like that that are present in air. So let's just do an example calculation. How many parts per million carbon dioxide are in the atmosphere? So what we would do is we would look at our table here and we would look for CO2. So there it is. And we can see here that the mole fraction of CO2 is 0 0.000394, et cetera. So if you're reporting the amount of carbon dioxide saying, oh, well, the mole fraction of 0 0.000394, it would get a little bit old. So instead, mole fraction gives us a viable way of reporting it. So the parts per million of CO2 are equal to the mole fraction times a million. So we'll multiply those two numbers together and we end up getting 394 parts per million. It just gives us a more tangible number to work with. Are there any questions? Anybody? Okay, let's move on with them. So here's an example calculation. You can just go back a slide really quick. Absolutely. Thank you. Sorry. No, no, don't apologize. And I, I'm sorry. I added this slide in this morning. Um, that's as an example. So I'll throw this one into the, uh, the lecture notes, the uh, skeleton notes that are posted. OK, I'm good. Thank you. You're welcome. And we'll talk a little bit more about nitrogen and about how nitrogen is inert and safe a little bit in a little bit when we talk about solubility. There's one case where nitrogen becomes unsafe and that's in the case of, we didn't talk about scuba diving in here, did we? I remember talking about scuba diving last week, but I don't think it was with. Okay. Nitrogen, usually safe, except scuba divers need to watch out for it. More on that shortly. Okay, so let's do an example calculation. How many grams of NaCl are needed to make a 500 milliliter solution of five molar NaCl? Okay, so oftentimes in these sort of problems, there can be a lot of numbers thrown at us. So let's just think about what we're given and what we're trying to find. We're given a volume and we're given the molarity of NaCl. So a key fact that we'll be using a lot is the fact that molarity is equal to the moles of the solute over liters of solution. So what this means is if you know the molarity of something and you know the volume of something, you can multiply them together to get the total moles. So I'm just gonna rearrange that equation. The moles of solute is equal to whatever the molarity is times the liters of solution. So to kind of make this a little bit more consolidated, let's just write out moles, are equal to molarity 
times volume. And the volume is in liters. Okay, so whenever you multiply molarity times volume together, you'll get the moles in a given sample. So let's do the specific example. So we have 50 milliliters. And remember that for every one liter, there are a thousand milliliters. I did not place the text very well. Let's change that. I can't, let's just clear it. I use the built built in PowerPoint pen instead. So moles are equal to molarity times volume. And we want to make sure that the volume is in liters. So we've converted into liters. The moles of solute will be equal to the five molar times the 0.5 liters which equals 2.5 moles of NaCl. But are we looking for moles here? No, we're looking for grams. But if we know moles, we can find grams. So it's 2.5 moles of NaCl. Using our periodic table, um, sodium weighs 23 grams per mole. Chlorine weighs about 35, so we'll add those together. Ends up being 58.44 grams per mole. Moles cancels out and we're left with grams. Okay. So if I wanted to make a salt solution, say for some sort of, um, say for some sort of, what would you use a salt solution in? Salt solutions are often used as like kind of drying agents to help extract out other things. Um, or let's just say I wanted to make a brine um, or some sort of very salty water to cook pasta in. What I would do is I would fill up something like this to the 500 milliliter mark, although this one's larger, it doesn't have the 500 milliliter mark. So maybe I would use this instead. It goes up to 250. So I would pour two of these in to my pot and then measure out 146 grams of sodium chloride and voila, I would have myself a five molar solution of NaCl. Any questions about that calculation? Okay, so the next one is a little bit more um, intensive a calculation, but it goes through, um, this is basically, if you could calculate something like this, you could calculate really any of the things that we'll see. This is a little bit more difficult than most of the problems we'll be working with, but I think it's a good challenging problem to work through. So, um, I don't know who all has calculators now. I was gonna do this as a um, remote clicker question. And look at that fun little animation. No, the beaker, where's it going? It's disappearing. Oh, it's being replaced with answers. Um, but I'd like to give you all, since I think it's a pretty good problem and it's based in fact, um, acetic acid is about 5% vinegar, or is about 5% acetic acid. Um, but we're going to revisit this problem on Friday Please give it a try before then though, because again, it is a good, nice challenging problem to work through. So um, given what we talk about today, I'd like you to revisit this problem, but for now we're going to move on. So if you have a solution with strong electrolytes in it, those electrolytes, again, the definition of an electrolyte is something that dissociates into ions in solution. So a common electrolyte used during winter is calcium chloride. Calcium chloride is in um, road salt. And what happens is calcium chloride dissociates into, well, for every one calcium chloride, we have one calcium, two plus, and we have two chloride ions. So each calcium chloride dissociates into three ions. And this is significant because the more concentrated a um, liquid solution is, in terms of ions, the lower the freezing point gets. There's this whole realm of study in chemistry called colligative properties that we won't really be discussing, except for now, because we're discussing it right now. Um, but just FYI, the more concentrated the saltier a solution is, the more ions you have in water, the lower the freezing point gets. So that's why you put 
salt calcium chloride on roads in the winter because it lowers the freezing point. And as a result, the, if the uh, temperature outside is less than zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, um, it can remain liquid water by virtue of having these ions dissolved into it. It also increases the boiling point of liquids. So if you pour salt into, say if you're cooking pasta and you make a salty solution to boil it in, you're actually increasing the boiling point. Not significantly, but by a little bit. So if you had a one molar solution of calcium chloride, it's a strong electrolyte. And strong electrolytes, do they stick together well in water? Nay, the water breaks them apart into their constituent ions. So you would get one molar of calcium two plus and two molar of chlorides because for every one calcium chloride, you're getting two chlorides. So you have twice as much Cl minus. For three molar total of ions. So with that in mind, I changed this question a little bit from how I originally had it on the skeleton notes. Um, consider these three different solutions here. We have 100 milliliters of 0.5 molar calcium chloride. We have 40 milliliters of one molar sodium chloride. And we have 10 milliliters of 0.4 molar iron chloride. So which of these do you think would have the largest concentration of ions? Take a moment. Um, don't write your answer into the chat. Just think about it. Ask me if you have any questions about it. So contemplate, maybe do a quick calculation, and then we'll come back and discuss this. And again, please let me know if you do have any questions. And a system that we've been using that works pretty well is when you feel ready, just type in ready or say ready. And then we'll discuss. Is it the 0.5 molar CaCl2? Or the one molar NaCl? Or the 0.4 molar iron chloride, which one would dissociate into the greatest concentration of ions? You know what? A good idea. So I'm not just awkwardly narrating. Let's use a little theme music here. That is a good idea. I should just start making these physical polls. Okay. Ooh. We'll give that, uh, that idea uh, a spin on Friday. Good call, Brianna. What do you think, ready to go? All right, let's discuss this problem. Is it A, is it B, is it C? Let's find out. So for calcium chloride, for every one calcium chloride, it turns into, for every one molar of calcium chloride, you get three molar worth of ions. So it's 0.5 molar, but for every one molar of calcium chloride, we actually get three molar of ions because each one dissociates into three ions, which means that this would have a total concentration of 1.5 molar ions. For our sodium chloride, it's one molar NaCl, but for every one NaCl, how many ions do we get? 
Not one, not three, but two. Which would give us two molar of ions. And then finally, iron chloride is 0.4 molar in this case for every, <gasps> I made a mistake. Yes, as I was saying, for every one iron chloride, you get four ions, one iron and three chlorides. So this would be 1.6 molar, which means our winner is the NaCl here, okay? So in this case, when dealing with concentrations here, did the 100 milliliters and the 40 milliliters and the 10 milliliters have anything to do with our answers in terms of concentration? Nay. If you have a whole ocean worth of salt water and you take a scoop of salt water, again, for some unknown reason out of it, the scoop is going to have the same concentration of ions as the entire ocean. So here we were just looking at concentration. The volume did not come into play. Any questions about that? Okie dokie. So now, um, going off of what Zachary mentioned before, there is a limit to how much solute we can dissolve into a solvent. Enter the concept of solubility. Solubility is the amount of a substance that dissolves in a given solvent at a given temperature to form what's called a saturated solution. So all solvents have some sort of tipping point. Some things you can dissolve a lot of solute into. An example is salt and water. So salt water, I don't know about you, um, but my friends in middle school, and actually past middle school, um, very mature. A common prank was if somebody were to go, say, buy a tasty cake after lunch, um, somebody might go up and start dumping salt into their beverage. Not cool, not cool. Anyway. Now this prank works well up to a certain point, but if you get greedy with it and you decide to put in the whole salt shaker, well, then the person's going to notice because not all of it's going to dissolve and they're going to have just salt in the bottom of their beverage. Good times. Anyway, there are limits. Even things that are very soluble have practical limits. So if you were to put 30 grams of NaCl into 100 milliliters of water, all of it will dissolve. So all 30 grams of that NaCl will end up dissolving into the solution. If you were to pour in 40 grams, you'd find that four grams of it will not dissolve into the solution. So what this means is that the tipping point of water at room temperature is um, 36 grams for every 100 milliliters or 0.1 liters. So we could report that in grams per, um, we could report that in grams per milliliter, grams per 100 milliliters, grams per liter, et cetera, which is still actually a lot of salt, but there is still a practical limit. So saturation versus supersaturated, an example experience. This is one of my favorite demos to do in class. Um, we make a pillar of salt using sodium acetate, obviously, um, I will try to do some kitchen demos moving forward. I don't have sodium acetate though, so I couldn't make the solution. Um, but this is, if you're looking for an activity to do, um, this is kind of the chemistry behind making rock candy. So let's talk about, I'll show you a video of what happens when you do this reaction. But first let's make some definitions. Saturated versus supersaturated. A saturated solution has the maximum amount of a given solute that will dissolve in a solvent under a particular set of conditions. So once you've reached that tipping point, once you've reached that 36 grams of salt for every 100 milliliters of water, that's called a saturated solution. Nothing else will dissolve into it. So before that tipping point, it's called unsaturated. Once you get to that point, it's called saturated. There are ways, however, of making a supersaturated solution where 
the amount of stuff dissolved in your solution is actually more than it can physically hold under those conditions. So let's pull up a video here of this phenomenon. Should I close it out? Ugh. Give me one moment. All right, here we go. So this is the pillar of salt. Let's wait for the video to load and I will put it onto our screen. Okay. And yes, before I mirror my browser, I do have about a billion tabs opened up. Don't judge. Okay. Chemtoddler.com. Oh, that sounds like a reliable source. Let's get to the good stuff. Okay. Look at all that salt crashing out of the solution. Why does that cement this hard to go with it too? Behold, the pillar of salt. So what starts as, okay. So what starts as what looks like an innocuous collection of just water, it's just clear water. When you pour it onto a seed crystal, this pillar of salt starts just abruptly um, crashing out of solution, precipitating into a solid. So what we're going to do is talk about why that is. What's going on here? Okay, I'm going to come back to this slide. I'm going to jump to the next one to talk about what's happening here. Some factors that affect solubility. One that we've talked about before is the like dissolves like principle. I'll go back to that in a moment. The one that specifically affects um, what's happening here with our supersaturated solution is temperature. Generally speaking, most things dissolve better at higher temperatures. So have you ever tried to dissolve sugar into a cold glass of iced tea, which I guess iced tea by definition is cold, but have you ever you know, tried putting in a few lumps of sugar. It doesn't dissolve super fast. But if you do it with, say, um, hot tea or hot coffee, the sugar will dissolve readily. The reason for that is that temperature has a direct effect on solubility. And most things will dissolve more readily. Water is better able to solvate most things. There are exceptions here at higher temperatures. So in order to create a super saturated solution, what you would do is, let's see, so let's look at glucose here. So glucose is right here on our graph. So what we're doing is we're plotting the solubility on the y-axis, the number of grams 
that will dissolve. And on the x-axis, we're plotting temperature. So notice that as temperature increases, the solubility of sugar increases a lot. So at the freezing point, you can dissolve, um, it looks to be about 44 grams of sugar for every 100 grams of H2O. But if we up the temperature to even 20 degrees Celsius, um, which is colder than room temperature, room temperature is about 25 or so degrees Celsius. So just that little increase means that we've basically doubled the solubility of sugar. So now at 20 degrees Celsius, you can hold 90 grams of sugar for every 100 grams of water and probably just keeps shooting up and up and up and up. There are practical limits to this, but has anybody out there made rock candy out of curiosity? Anybody? Sometimes a fun um, middle school science experiment and a delicious one. Let's see, we have a response in the chat. We have a few responses. Okay, cool. So some of you have participated in this phenomenon of supersaturation. Basically the idea is you boil water. You can dissolve a lot of sugar in boiling water. Then you cool it down to a much cooler temperature. At colder temperatures, sugar isn't as soluble. So what you've done then is you created a supersaturated solution. So if for example, you boil the water and you dump in a bag of sugar, that sugar will probably dissolve pretty readily. Once you cool it though to zero degrees Celsius, you've dissolved more sugar than it can actually handle. The thing is, it doesn't precipitate out as a solid immediately. It needs to be perturbed somehow. So you have a solution that's on the edge. Once you do something to push it past the tipping point, in the case of rock candy, you put in a string. The string acts as a nucleation site where the precipitate, the solid can start forming, and you get these crystals that form out. That's the idea behind rock candy is taking advantage of a super saturated solution. So going back, another thing that affects solubility that we've already talked about is the like dissolves like principle. So here we have ethanol. And if we look at ethanol, what type of molecule is ethanol? So the structure of ethanol is, looks like this. It's got two carbons and then an OH group. So we have an alcohol on there. And it turns out ethanol and methanol are pretty good solvents because they have a little bit of hydrocarbon to them, but they're still small molecules. They're still very polar. So molecules like this are very good at dissolving um, both small polar molecules and also large hydrocarbon chains. So specifically, let's look at this table of solubility here. This is an alcohol. It has the whole, it has the trifecta of intermolecular forces. It's got London dispersion forces. It's got dipole-dipole interactions. It's got hydrogen bonding. All of these things are available to it. So down here, we have a table of the solubility of alcohols in water versus cyclohexane. So looking at these smaller alcohols, methanol, ethanol, propanol, etc. These will all dissolve completely in water. So you can pour them, they'll mix well, but as we add in more hydrocarbons, what do you notice is happening to the amount that will dissolve? So as we add in more and more carbons to our hydrocarbon chains, like we're doing right here, notice that the solubility goes from infinite to 8.6 grams per 100 milliliters to 2.82 to 0.62 to 0.028. So the more carbons and hydrogens we're putting in, the less soluble things generally are in water. And again, that's a phenomenon that we already um, discussed. Whereas cyclohexane, cyclohexane is this molecule, six carbons in a cyclic structure. So this is C6. H12. This is a nonpolar molecule. You can dissolve a little bit of methanol into it, but any other of these alcohols will dissolve very, very, very readily. 
So um, you can dissolve an infinite amount of um, ethanol, propanol, butanol, pentanol, hexanol, etc. So that again is an application of the like dissolves like principle that we've already explored. So the trend is that as we add more carbons to a chain, something will be more soluble, generally speaking, in um, some sort of organic solvent, something with just carbons and hydrogens. And we call this the hydrocarbon character versus the polar character of a solvent. So this we've discussed more before, but this also affects solubility. So the last thing that we're going to do today is we're going to take a closer look at this graph here and just work on interpreting it. So how many grams of KNO3 will dissolve in 100 grams of water at 50 degrees Celsius? So there is an information overload on this graph. Just be able to generally interpret it. So in order to interpret this, what we would do is first we need to find KNO3 on here. So KNO3 is right here. So at lower temperatures, so at zero degrees Celsius, about 23 or so grams, 100 grams of water. And then at higher temperatures, it gets higher and higher and higher and higher. So what we'll do in order to answer this is we want to know um, 50 degrees Celsius. So we're gonna look for 50 degrees Celsius and then whoop, 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 whoop. we're gonna work our way up. And it looks here like, about a little over 90 or so. So about 90 grams will dissolve at 50 degrees Celsius in 100 grams of water. But what if we had twice as much water? So if we had 200 grams of water, how many grams of the KNO3, the potassium nitrate would dissolve? Well, if you've got twice as much water, you can dissolve twice as much stuff. So in 200 grams of water, since it's 90 grams, for every 100 grams of water, all we have to do is multiply this by 200 grams of water. And grams of water cancels out. And we'd be able to dissolve 180 grams of the KNO3. Alrighty. And